on camera. Good. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ed Woods. Uh, we're the day is on uh, September 26, okay. 2019. We're at the Atlanta History Center with Sue Verhoff and John Lilly. John Lewis. Lilly. And we're interviewing Jim Kiley. Uh, Jim, this is uh, uh, an interview for you and your family to do what you feel and to say what you wish. It is about your early life, your military life, and afterwards, and whatever else you'd like to say about what you did. It's, it's your interview. Okay. Uh, I really don't have anything else to say. We will get started. Uh, I probably will ask you questions during it, and, and I don't mean to interrupt you. I won't interrupt you anymore than I feel necessary to clarify something you may have said. Uh, I'd like to know where, where were you born, and, and give us a little brief history of your life before the military. Uh, my name is Jim Kiley. Uh, a, uh, my parents uh, lived in Illinois. I was born in Peoria, Illinois, born in 1941. Uh, I was an only child. Uh, my father was an only child from Chicago. Uh, and pertinent to what we're probably going to talk, my, my father uh, was in the, was a pharmacist mate, which we now call Corman, uh, with the 5th Marine Division in Guadalcanal in China. And he actually, he was in China uh, when the bomb was dropped. Uh, and he was expected to go with their division to when they're going to invade China, uh, invade, uh, invade Japan, uh, and and sort of this has some impact on what because uh, what uh, happened later on as far as my when I got my draft notice. Anyway, my father was with the uh, on Guadalcanal in China, and then. Uh, we moved, my dad worked with Wrigley Chewing Gum Company and we traveled from place to place from, from Peoria to Kansas City, Kansas to uh, Michigan and then finally made it down to uh, Jacksonville, Florida and in Jacksonville when I graduated from high school um, that's when I decided to come to Emory, went to Emory from uh, 59 through 63 then medical school 63-67. and. Um, I was drafted out of uh, uh, at my last year of medical school when I had just gotten my that I was the real thing doctor. Uh, that I was drafted into the Navy. Um, you, I will. You want me to just keep yeah. on? <laughs> keep keep on and and. Okay, and so I, my we were married in '66. Uh, and then I was drafted, and obviously uh, right before I went to Vietnam. Um, interesting, at Grady, where most of us were tr training at that time for in Atlanta, uh, when you had this form, you had to fill out saying who were people that you could use as uh, to verify your character and whatever. Interesting, with the three people that I used, all of us were drafted. <laughs> uh, we weren't uh, too sure to put a hex on us. And then um, um, I remember getting my uh, draft notice. I was down at Grady, and I said I was in the Navy. And so I decided to find out where I'd been assigned. And I remember vividly going across the street from Grady Hospital to a payphone, which people don't really realize there were payphones one time. And I finally found some money to payphone and call and they said on my orders that I was assigned to Camp Pendleton, California. And I said, that's a strange name for a Navy base. Because my wife and I thought, well, we'll go in the Navy and sort of see the world and, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, then all of a sudden I called Camp Pendleton and, and realized I was assigned to the 1st Marine Division, who was stationed in Camp Pendleton. That was a permanent headquarters. And then Camp Pendleton, I called out there and I said, where is the 1st Marine Division? Well, they're now in I-Corps, South Vietnam. 
and I realized right then that I was screwed. So, <laughs> uh, so it, it, at the time, I, my, we just found out my wife was uh, pregnant, and I'll come back to my office. I have a little show and tell in a second. And uh, so then the question is, did I want to, you know, try to go on the Barry plan, which is a way physicians could defer their active duty uh, by going into some um, specialty and say well, after two or three years of taking specialty training, then you're obligated for service after, uh, after your Barry plan years. And uh, for some reason, we, I couldn't come up with uh, a program like the CDC or, or places or some interest that I should have, should have in retrospect done because I would have, I would have uh, postponed my Vietnam uh, experience and probably would have postponed it totally because probably by the time I got out I wouldn't have had to go. But it, needless to say, going back to my father, when I got my orders, and I, I said, well, you know, maybe I should, you know, do, my dad got drafted and he did his duty, maybe I should do my duty, uh, whatever that might mean. So anyway, I, my wife and I talked about it and said, well, uh, well, I'll just go ahead. This was before I knew I was assigned to Vietnam. Probably if I'd known it <laughs> at the time, I, it would have been nice to say, well, once you put me on board a ship out of San Diego someplace. But anyway, that didn't work out. So uh, we, I was uh, drafted into the Navy as a physician attached to the 1st Marine Division. And we went to Camp Pendleton to learn how to uh, salute officers. And, and the, uh, the, some of the uh, corpsmen told you how to deal with various diseases, venereal disease, et cetera, et cetera. So there's rather colorful descriptions of what told us how, how we treat the Marines. And then uh, they taught us how to use an M16 and 45. And uh, we went on a night bivouac and heard all these gunshots. Uh, and we prayed that the, those were blanks, not real bullets, and crawled on the ground, pretended like we were real soldiers. And then uh, after a couple of weeks of that, sent to uh, San Francisco awaiting uh, our uh, transfer orders uh, you know, to uh, Travis Air Force Base. We flew from Travis to Okinawa. And when you got Okinawa, then you were assigned uh, and you waited there two or three days before they flew you into country. Um, interesting, when we flew into country in Da Nang, and that was uh, in August of 68, um, we got in there about two or three in the morning. Uh, as obviously it's dark. Uh, they, the, the, the 200 people on our plane were all replacement doctors and dentists for the First Marine Division, and the and the Navy would rotate every 12 months. The Marines were every 13 months, and so we were the replacement physicians and dentists for uh, for that area of, of I Corps, and so they put us all on these open bed trucks at two or three in the morning and drove us through Da Nang, because we landed at Da Nang Airport, to some place. Uh, and then all these empty buildings with the had some mattresses on the ground that they told us to find our mattress and find a bed and throw the mattress on the, on the bed and they'll get us in the morning. And I mean, we didn't know where we were. We didn't see any, any guys with guns around us protecting us and I figured well, this is the best way to get rid of 200 doctors and dentists. <laughs> anyway, we survived. And then that next morning we got up they took us to uh, um, uh, near in Da Nang to the, where the commanding general 1st Marine Division was and you got your orders where you were assigned to. Um, so uh, at that time we I was assigned to uh, 3rd Battalion, 11th Regiment, uh, which was in support of the 7th Regiment. 1st uh, Marine Division uh, encompassed all the way from uh, uh, south of Da Nang up to uh, uh, the DMZ. Uh, assigned to 311, 311 was actually an artillery uh, battalion in support of the 7th Regiment, which was an infantry battalion. And we were 
my where I was assigned to was a battalion aid station uh, on Hill 55, which is about oh 30, 50 miles, I'm never quite too sure, south of Den, uh, Da Nang. Uh, I, I was there except for a brief time I had to come back to, uh, to um, Atlanta because of a, a medical emergency. I was there until um, uh, I left to come back to the States and uh, resume my training at Grady Hospital in uh, 1970. 69, sorry. Um, so I was fortunate. I was not in the field with the grunts. Uh, I was with the grunts, but I was not 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 with uh, where people I thought were shooting at me. Um, I, I didn't realize at the time how fortunate I really was with the assignment that I had. Um, we were on Hill 55, which had tanks and had the headquarters for the 7th Regiment, and we took care of anybody on top of the hill as far as any medical concern or emergencies. Um, and, uh, you know, the corpsmen were so well trained all co at that time, and all college graduates, and maybe they still are, but they were so well trained, they really didn't need a MD <laughs> physician to give them. I, I don't really know why I was there, but I was there. I guess I was the fallback guy if they had a question, but you know I remember we had sick call at you know usually nine in the morning and one o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, you know they were beating you know they try to I'm sure they would like for me not to show up because they you know they this is what they did all their training for so take care of Marines and so very qualified and uh, you can't ask for anything better than a good corpsman. And uh, and they were the doc for all most of the Marines, not the do not a doctor doctor like me, so but they were they were the docs for the for the uh, for the Marines. Um, so during my time at Hill 55, we had a lot of you know, different things sort of occurred. I'll, I'll sort of give you a scenario. I did write a, an article about this. Uh, and this was for uh, the Atlanta Medical Association, and this was called, and this was had to do with our experiences in Vietnam. Uh, a couple of friends of mine who had been there, and so everybody sort of wrote, mine was BAS 311, and uh, and I wrote this a number of years ago, and, and, and I might have to refer to it about some circumstances but um, when we were there we uh, we were sort of a top of a hill um, we were guarded with the Marines around the uh, perimeter uh, really didn't think we we didn't worry though I will tell you in retrospect knowing about the drugs that were rampant the French had left drugs there and so, and so it, it, I didn't realize it, it was the position of these Marines, but uh, and we never found if anybody was taking drugs. But you sort of, in retrospect, you worried about it. when these guys are working during the day, then they had their assignment at night. Are they awake? Uh, are they taking something the French had left over? And uh, I, but here, in regard, that was in, in retrospect. But while there, a couple of instances, uh, uh, we uh, delivered uh, 11 babies. And uh, first of all, my expertise is internal medicine, which is not obstetrics. And first of all, the Vietnamese women had been delivering babies without us for years. But they would come to the hill, and we would go down to the gates to pick them up, because this is the only time that, that they could be out of their hamlet, and they, we would keep them overnight, which was sure like a vacation to them because their husbands wouldn't make them go out in the fields and start working as soon as they delivered. We gave them sheets, and and uh, you know we made something over them, and so anyway, we sort of had a, a obstetric ward, uh, but again they didn't need us, but we sort of it was nice to have have doing something positive. We did do a number of med caps, which we'd go out in the um, 
surrounding hamlets and and try to help. Mainly, it was the problems were skin diseases, uh, and uh, probably the most important person in the med cap was the dentist, because most of those people never obviously knew of or seen a dentist, and though there's not much he could do himself except pull a tooth if necessary, but they did that. And uh, so we, uh, we, I mean that was diversion. Then, as far as the people, sort of the emergencies or we had there at 311 was a couple of Marines um, uh, obviously fearful of being killed in Vietnam. A um, couple of them shot themselves so we had self-inflicted wounds and, and sometimes they were smart where they shot, sometimes they weren't so smart where they shot. Uh, one young man shot himself in the, in the calf and the perineal nerve is there and and has a permanent foot drop as a result of that. But he, he did get out of Vietnam. <laughs> but I'm not too sure that was what he was thinking about. He's going to cause permanent injury. Um, you know, we had, usually we had, we were at a place where there was not a lot of fighting around us. But if there was a lot of, if there was fighting near us, uh, the medevac helicopters would drop by and and if they had dead they would and they didn't they wanted to go back to pick up wounded they would drop off the dead and we would sort of keep them in a bunker until they came back the next day and put them in body bags um, but you know we really didn't see that many active gunshot wounds um, the most terrible thing I ever really saw was we were around the perimeter of the hill we were uh, was uh, they would, Marines would go around and, and look at the fence to be sure it was, you know, nobody clipped anything. And, and so uh, as we were, one of the poor young Marines um, stepped on a mine and blew off his legs ab above his knees. And so we got called, I'm talking about the, uh, we had a little makeshift uh, Jeep ambulance to go down to the gate to pick up this poor young man, and uh, we brought him up to the uh, uh, the tent. I can still see him there. Here he has no legs, uh, or at least below his, uh, you know, mid thigh. Um, you know, it says help me, help me, and um, uh, we gave him morphine. We all had we had all day aid stations had syrets of morphine, so we. Try to start an IV, which he couldn't. He was such in shock, he didn't. You couldn't find an IV site. Gave him a number of syrets of morphine. Uh, called the medevac helicopter, to come pick him up. And you know, you, I don't know. You just, I can still remember us in retrospect saying, you know, this, he's not going to live. It just, he was in so much pain. You just hoped he died. And unfortunately, uh, he did die on the way from. From uh, from our battalion aid station uh, to when they flew them into Da Nang, Da Nang is where they had two different hospital companies where you sent everybody who needed uh, in hospital care. So, you know, it, that was probably the worst instance. Um, um, another time, uh, I was uh, there was a firefight uh, near our hill from a company of the Seventh Regiment and. And um, and they, you could hear the gunshots, and uh, there was a tower on a hill, sort of like a, you see on a forestry. So I went to the top and with the big binoculars, and you could see the firefight. And unfortunately, two, a number of the Marines were killed, uh, but it was the captain and the first sergeant. And, and always you. And the, the sort of when a firefight's going on and people are firing in all directions, you don't know if he got killed by Viet Cong or NVA or he got killed by friendly fire. Anyway, so they brought them back to the hill and we, you know, they were dead, but we took, tried to take care of them and, um, uh, you know, get them ready for the medevac helicopters to uh, take them back to Da Nang where they had the mortuary. Uh, a couple of not so, well, then another serious incident that occurred was uh, 
we were, we had a mess hall like all military areas had, and the the cooks in the mess hall were usually passed over enlisted men, so this, they were not too happy being the mess cook. But anyway, uh, this mess cook must have had a problems elsewhere before he came to Hill 55 because one night uh, while he was in his bed somebody dropped a grenade in his bed uh, called, and it was called fragging and um, dropped a grenade in his bed and blew him in half and uh, so again we heard a grenade go off and we were about oh or where we stayed and where our battalion aid station was about a couple hundred yards from there but this was two or three in the morning and so they called us to come and you know we obviously verified he was dead and then we all had to sign a certificate for the Navy uh, internal security or marine internal security about what we'd found and I don't know if they ever found out who dropped the grenade and, and I'm not apparently he was not well liked so it could have been anybody um, the other thing, one of our daily, you know, you, you get sort of bored between because even though I've told you some of the, <laughs> I'll say memorable events, most days were not memorable. They were just routine. And uh, uh, one day we, usually about every once a month, we went and re had sandbags and you pour the sand out because sandbags were deteriorating. and poured the sand back into the new sandbags and, and around our bunker and while I was on my knees doing this with uh, a snake stuck its head up between two uh, sandbags and I, I think it was green with a hit red head but whatever it was I didn't stay around to see what it was and he went one place or maybe it was a she he or she went one place I, and I went one place and the importance of that is because I remember that snake being in those sandbags. Well, about in uh, right after Christmas, uh, we were uh, attacked by 122 uh, rockets, and and there was usually about three in the morning, and so you hear the rockets hit the ground, and then the, the gravel would go up in the air and and shower your uh, hooch where you were in and hooch has had a metal roof and so you hear the rocks and so the first rock rocket hit and and you said you know should I do anything then second rocket or third rocket hit N not we don't know how far away but then you say well you know this is foolish so you you know you had your skivvies on you found your 45 you put your helmet on and the first thing I thought about when I went out where uh, barracks where I was staying was where was that snake? So you had to jump in a hole, which you you would so to protect you. But I really hesitated jumping in that hole because I knew that snake was there somewhere. So so my 45 was ready. Hopefully I would shoot him if he was there. But at least I, that was my fear, not about getting hit by a 122 rocket, but more about getting a snake bite. And with that thought in mind, this, some of this so much show and tell. Most people don't really hear about shrapnel wounds and whatever, but this is, I don't know if you can really see it. Um, this is what shrapnel looks like. So when you hear about somebody who's injured or killed by shrapnel, you can see this is the outside of a 20, 122 rocket was exploded. And uh, I picked this up off the ground outside of our hooch. Yeah, Jim, hold one of those up by your by your face where we can kind of get it. Yeah. And uh, so I picked these up off the ground outside where our hooch. And that was the first and fortunately only time we were ever uh, attacked. Uh, and um, so you know, and, uh, and fortunately nobody was hurt on the hill. Um, uh, I'm sure scared, <laughs> frightened, but nobody was injured uh, except maybe falling on the gravel trying to get into the uh, your bunker, to, uh, but otherwise no other serious injuries. Um, only uh, again, most of our life was revolved around sick call, 
which, as I said, my corpsman would prefer I didn't show up uh, because they wanted to take care of it. And, um, uh, and uh, sort of a lot of routine things. Every day was a meeting with the commanding officer. And always we had a sort of to keep in shape or exercise. We had a, a, a called a jungle volleyball. And jungle volleyball means you can hit, you can touch the net. <laughs> it was not it was not sinful to touch the net. You you didn't get penalized. So we were out pl playing quote jungle volleyball about five o'clock one time, and one of our own um, howitzers had a random uh, fire, and and uh, the shell landed about a hundred yards from our. Volley, a volleyball court, if you want to call that. It was not a court. And uh, it was frightening. And, and all of us who were playing were all officers. And, and uh, if, it was a, if it was a way to get back at an officer, it was about the best time. But it was not intentional, but, you know, it was a misfire or misdirection or what do you want to call it. But it made volleyball exciting from then on, listening to see if another shell would come our way. It was from our own uh, uh, 155s. Other sort of tragic thing, each obviously battalion aid station had um, had uh, corpsmen, with, obviously with the chief, and they were all you know, very smart, great people. Um, but we have a, a Battery usually they're in different places around uh, the countryside, and they'd have six 155s and have their own uh, group of people and two corpsmen. Well, one night uh, one of the batteries was attacked by the uh, Viet Cong NVA and uh, overrun, and uh, and when that happens at two or three o'clock in the morning, and then. I mean, all sort of hell broke loose, and this is the, what we what was told to us. I was not there, but people started firing, uh, and uh, and then they said corpsmen up, and uh, two of our corpsmen, the two corpsmen who were there, were killed, um, and the only you know they're probably the only people I really knew personally who were killed. And, uh, and because they were, you know, the Marines needed them because they were wounded, but then also you don't know about people who are firing in any direction, watching any pe person moving, uh, and we never, I never heard if, if all of them had autopsies, whether they were done there or back in, in uh, Japan where a lot of the bodies were taken. But whether you know whose shells, uh, but anyway, they they were killed. And uh, remember having to write letters, one to a mother and one to a wife, about them. It was uh, fortunately my chief corpsman, um, uh, Jerry Harris, was um, he knew he sort of knew what to write, and so he <laughs> he wrote the letter for me. Uh, we both. He, I signed it. Then he he sent something else separately. But uh, I remember, you know, trying to, you know, what do you say to somebody who's your son or husband just died, and you're not too sure all the circumstances, and you say it was for the glory of our country, or, or like, you know, you just don't know really know what the words were. And, uh, anyway, uh, that that was probably the only time uh, any of the corpsmen who were injured were obviously killed. Uh, during my time in Vietnam, as I might have mentioned, my wife was pregnant, and um, and so uh, so when I left for Vietnam in end of August, uh, she I think she was about three or four months pregnant. So while in Vietnam. Uh, you know, I get status reports. Fortunately, she was here in Atlanta, uh, worked at SunTrust Bank, or it was, I guess, called Trust Company at that time. And all of her 
compatriots looked out for her, did everything to help her as they could. But while I was there, I said, well, I'll get some baby gifts. Well, one of the baby gifts was a little shirt. Uh, and uh, you can say it's never been used because by the time I got it back to my wife, our son was was big enough he couldn't <laughs> use it. Anyway, sort of pretty though. Um, uh, but when I, our son was born on, on January 24th, uh, uh, 1969, and they notified me. Uh, the Red Cross was able to notify through a uh, through the radio up there on the top of the hill, and uh, so I, they woke me up about two or three in the morning and said, "Come out here, hear about your son." And, and uh, uh, they told me my wife and son were healthy, and um, then uh, and actually I'd sent my wife right before Christmas of that year two uh, cards, which are sort of congratulations. And one was at the bottom of this envelope says "If a girl," and the other envelope "If a boy." Uh, so uh, we still have the envelopes. Uh, uh, obviously, if a girl's never been opened, but <laughs> but if a boy who has, um, and that was in January. Then I met my wife for uh, R and R, which we met in Hawaii in March. Unfortunately, while we were, my parents took care of uh, my son Jamie, while uh, and they were in South Florida, and they'd come up and get Jamie and take him down to. South Florida. Unfortunately, while there, uh, my son started to have uh, problems with pain in an eye, and so uh, I took him to an ophthalmologist and found out he was blind in one eye and had glaucoma, which is very painful. It's because of a congenital problem. So my wife didn't know anything about it before she left. We heard about it uh, while we were there in Hawaii, and so. Uh, we both flew back to Atlanta and then to pick him up in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and uh, so I was left um, country, or at least Vietnam and Hawaii on our uh, to uh, see my son for the first time. And uh, we were here for a couple of weeks. And then I went out to, uh, I think, Dobbins or wherever I was supposed to go. To find out if it was supposed to return, because after so many months, if you're out of country or if you've done your tour, whether it be six months, nine months, ten months, eleven months, uh, you might 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 need to return. Well, this person said I needed to return, and even though it was, I think I was nine or ten months at that time, so. Anyway, I had me in my life, my had me, my wife, and a child who just recently had, a, a, you know, found to have serious one eye, obviously uh, one eye a problem, and uh, had to fly back to Vietnam. And then I still remember flying in to Vietnam. You go back to uh, to the commanding general there at, at the First Marine Division, and. Uh, and uh, the first comment out of his mouth was, uh, we didn't expect you back. And I said, you didn't expect me back? I mean, I was told that I had to come back. So anyway, uh, I decided right then I had what's called a short timer's attitude. I wasn't going to do anything. I can get shot at, <laughs> injured. So. Uh, they moved. I moved from battalion aid station to regimental uh, aid station when the regiment uh, was in uh, Da Nang itself. So I was there, and I, I can't say that I did anything worthwhile <laughs> last several months. Uh, then flew back home, and and um, uh, and uh, I think I came back in July. And after returning. Um, uh, we, my wife and I were, whenever you were, the first year you were in overseas duty, second year you could pick where you wanted to go for your two-year tour. And um, uh, Orlando Navy Hospital 
was in existence then, it's not no longer. And uh, so I went down there and we were there for a year in Orlando uh, for the Navy Hospital. And then after that year, we came back to Atlanta and um, I finished my training in internal medicine at Grady and then went into private practice in 1973 uh, and been in uh, Atlanta slash Sandy Springs since then. Did your, when you, when you left, when you got your orders to report to Pendleton, uh -huh. did you, you and your wife fly out there or did you right. drive out there? Or? Uh, we flew out there. And yeah. she, then when you left and she flew back to Atlanta? Well, we flew from Atlanta out to uh, uh, San Diego, mm -hmm. found a, uh, apartment uh, and then actually a good friend of mine, Earl McKenzie, he, he was one of the people that you had, you put down as somebody who could verify your character or whatever. We all got drafted, all of us were in Vietnam. And uh, his lady friend at that time went with us. And so we all four went out there and uh, Joanne and, and, uh, and uh, this lady had a, a motel not too far from Camp Pendleton. Then we finished our training. Uh, we had uh, about two weeks, I think, before we flew to Vietnam, and we f uh, flew to uh, uh, San Francisco. And enjoyed San Francisco, though it was it was the time where all the hippies and, uh, and it was sort of fun driving around and see about hmm. all these people that didn't want to be in Vietnam and. And all these things that you're from somewhat uh, closed in society of Atlanta, and you go out to San Francisco, you say there's a different group of people in, in the United States. And uh, we enjoyed that. Then uh, we flew, uh, my wife flew back to Atlanta, and then uh, we flew from uh, Travis to Okinawa. But when you were drafted, uh were you drafted as an officer or as an enlisted man? I was drafted as an officer. By that time, I was, my last year of medical school, um, uh, I, I think maybe even a month or two before I graduated and become, became a real doctor, <laughs> uh, you, got your, you got a form saying, you know, you need to tell us about yourself and what branch of the service you would like to go in. I think they gave us a choice, and maybe they didn't and who you, who people about your character. And, and then in that June, um, we pe took the state board of Georgia, and so we really were the real thing. Um, but I was drafted as a as medical corps, lieutenant medical, medical corps. So, I mean, you know, I had the two bars look like a captain, and everybody, well, thought, no. I, everybody thought I was a captain, but you know, I was just a lonely. Lieutenant the Navy. <laughs> uh, I understand that completely. When you came back to Atlanta after your military service and you and your wife settled, you settled in private practice in the Sandy Springs area? Well, actually, when I came back from uh, Orlando, uh, I had three years at Grady Hospital from 70, 73 uh, in internal medicine, trained under. Uh, Emory, Dr. Hurst, and so I did th three years of internal medicine. Uh, and as I told, tell people, I, they said, what is an internist? Well, it's sort of like an, an adult pediatrician. So, you know, I was, so we were here in, in Atlanta. My wife had a f great job with a uh, trust company in the uh, trust department. And she w didn't want to leave, and I didn't. There was no reason for me to go elsewhere, um, so we, we've stayed and stayed in the greater Atlanta area ever since. How is your son with his? Well, the one, we have three sons too, uh, but the the one son who was born while while we was overseas, he uh, uh, it's it's a congenital thing, and whether it was. We wondered for whether it was due to a medication um, given my, when my wife was pr pregnant but worried about having a miscarriage to try to help her prevent miscarriage. 
and we always wonder if that drug prescribed for her was the cause of this eye problem. It's called uh, congenital hyperplasia of the primary vitreous. It's, a, it's somewhat a, a rare problem, seen mainly in males, you know, where all of a sudden uh, one eye doesn't really develop normally. And as a complication of that, you get glaucoma, which causes pain, and that's why when we were, my, my parents were taking care of him while he was continuing to rub his eye because it was painful. But anyways, eventually he had a nucleation, a nucleation tape. The eye was removed, uh, and then a prosthetic eye was placed. Uh, and that was done while he was in college. And he's, now he's a, a physician, a neurologist out in Eugene, Oregon. So uh, then we have two other sons and who were who were uh, fine, but, but 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 sort of one thing I, is that when we came back after the service and we tried to get pregnant, uh, and uh, my poor wife went through all those you know all those tests women have to go through, uh, and uh, and so I you know and I checked to see if uh, something's wrong with me and. Um, and so they kept saying that there was something wrong with my sperm. Now, I'm not too sure. <laughs> this is not for public knowledge. But, uh, and then in retrospect, uh, I was exposed to Agent Orange. And I'm part of the Agent Orange uh, because of cancer. And so I, the, I, I, didn't, we, I didn't even realize, I mean, I didn't even know Agent Orange was there. Or at least we were being sprayed with it. And that was only recent, at least I guess years and years later we even knew about something like that. But I almost wonder if my problems with uh, sperm was because of uh, uh, my exposure to Agent Orange, because I do know it led to uh, one of the conditions that was cancer. And so, you know, I, I, I never thought about it until recent years until I really pursued the Agent Orange study. and. Uh, uh, and uh, you know disability, or at least getting some sort of check from the government about that. So you were in country about nine months, then you went on R and R. Yeah. Yeah, that that's was, unusual. Well, well, you mean because a lot of times it's six months. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, also my wife was pregnant at seven. So they had to. <laughs> Yeah, and she couldn't fly, and, uh, and so we, so we met in March uh, of that year, and so, uh, but a lot of you know, a lot, a lot of the guys were going to any number of places, in Thailand, et cetera, et cetera. And so they were seeing the world. The Marines were, <laughs> they were seeing that. something. <laughs> so. So, uh, in a way, I, my, you know, I exposed to great people, both Marines who, and the corpsmen, though I, I will tell you the Marines, I'm glad they're on our side because some of them are a little, you give us 18 year old an M16 and uh, you sometimes wonder about that. And also I was there when the uh, Black Power Salute was in vogue and you go from Da Nang to uh, down to, uh, I'm sorry, from Hill 55 to Da Nang, and uh, you see some black uh, Marines along the side of the road, and, and one of our corpsmen was black, and, and so you go along and they'd be raising their fists in the black salute, and you know, uh, and uh, you know, there, there was camaraderie of color. But that didn't really occur in the field. What I mean is, this was mainly when they were on, going to some place where they were with a larger group of people. But I still remember driving along in a Jeep and, and you see the Black Power salute and, and uh, you, you wonder how that it would affect grunts out in the field when you had a platoon and company but I, I've never heard that it did affect how they, you know. There was, 
somewhat of a camaraderie of being miserable together <laughs> rather than being, you know, when you're solo like that. So. How far south of Da Nang was Hill 55? About, you know, it's a good question. I, I think about 30, 35 miles. I, you know, I should know. Um, um, but, Close uh, to July. Yeah, it, it was a little north of July. Now we did. Um, yeah, I, I still uh, things you remember uh, uh, that on Hill Fifty Five, you know, I was in a hooch with uh, uh, Armed Forces. Um, I mean, Air Force uh, person and a couple other people all assigned to the our re, our uh, battalion. Um, and I remember this gunny sergeant, Marine gunny sergeant, who, because of they didn't have enough officers, was a warrant officer, and long John Silver, bald-headed guy. And he parlayed something to get uh, Korean uh, sea rats, and that was kimchi. And I never smelled kimchi, and hope not to smell it again, but it was what sort of and mill, uh, onions and something else, and open the, open the Korean sea rat tent in our hooch, and you smell that, and gosh, oh my, yeah. Anyway, but uh, uh, but also we 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 also besides the med cats, I did leave the hill for a couple of weeks. We did a uh, op operation near the Laotian border, and they uh, part part of our Battalion aid station, myself and a couple of corpsmen, and, and uh, went out near the Laotian border, uh, and we were bivouac there for about two weeks, and um, uh, and you know, like I said, we were not busy like from a medical standpoint, uh, but two instances happened there. One is while there, uh, two, two Marine helicopters. We were on a little tiny hill. We must have lost sight of each other. We obviously must not have been talking to each other. And remember the Marines, with the people who piloted their their planes and helicopters were, were, were officers, not warrant officers. A lot of the Army were warrant officers, which is not disrespectful. But, but these people have been, been around for a while. These were uh, captains and majors. And anyway, these two helicopters going around uh, this small little hill uh, ran into each other, and uh, it, it was a horrible crash. I mean, you could hear it. We all, everybody there, ran out. It was right along a river, ran out onto a beach. In retrospect, if anybody ever planted mines on a beach, they would have had a lot of people dead. But nobody thought twice about running out to see what you could do to help them. And one helicopter uh, was. Had burned and everybody there were four of them in there and died. Another helicopter. Um, the, the bodies were inside, but their helmets and the heads in the helmets were outside, and it was gruesome. And then you think these 17 and eight, well, I assume seven, 18 year old Marines, having to put these people in the body bags. So you hear about post traumatic stress disorder. And, the exposure of what they had to their daily lives, and you see having to, you know, put these people into uh, what we used to be people into body bags, and uh, I always wonder, you, no wonder you people have such a flashback of bad times there. The only humorous thing, which that was not, was that when we when we went there, we went there in, 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 in trucks, open bed trucks. But by the time we, two, two weeks later, we were about to go back, the bridges had flooded out because of the rainy season. And uh, so we, most of us had to fly back in helicopters. Well, on, on the, my run from where I was, my place, a tent where I was staying, to the helicopter, which was taking me back to Hill 55, um, I fell into a latrine. And, uh, and, I mean, 
uh, you know, your little creams you used and you covered them over, you didn't know it was there because there was, it was now some other place. So I was running to this helicopter and I fell into to, to my waist. Uh, and I still remember getting on that that helicopter and all these poor enlisted guys having <laughs> they looked at me didn't say a word and I'm I, I, I mean they, I'm sure they said God oh my, my. I had my my you know my lieutenant bars my captain bar so I, I was probably the highest ranking person on the elevator on the on the helicopter and I, mean, I must have, I just can't think. I can imagine what uh, they said. Horrible. Well, Another they, officer. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they said, I'm sure under the, I mean, they said it went. So we got back to Hill 55, and, and when the helicopter landed, I got off. I did a strip tease right there in the middle of the helicopter pad because I figured that the, somebody could buy me new pants and, and shoes some other time. But anyway, that was somewhat humorous anyway. I still remember their look on their face looking at me, so. They, they probably do too. <laughs> I mean, it was. Did you, uh, during your time in country, did you ever, were you able ever to see USO shows? Uh, we did, we had, um, the answer is yes, no. I mean, I knew they were around, uh, usually when they had USO shows, I'd let the corpsman, uh, you know, go and I'd sort of pinch hit, I mean, because we weren't all that busy, but somebody had to be, be there. Mm -hmm. um, but we did, um, you know, I did, I'm sure there were famous people showed up, and a lot of uh, Filipino uh, groups came and, uh, and they were, and they could mimic anything in the United States as far as music or Johnny Cash or you name it. But I never saw anybody famous, if you want to say that. And then, is there anything else that you would feel like you need to say or any opinions, anything that you that may be on your mind? Well, uh, uh, you know, I, I feel fortunate I was assigned to a artillery battalion where I didn't have to do much of anything. But on the other hand, you know, I thought it was, it, from a professional standpoint, uh, it was a wasted year. I hate to say that because, you know, people you know, were getting killed around me, and, or at least, you know, but from I mean, I really didn't use my training, um, uh, and because uh, I had corpsmen were probably, I mean, were so sharp, and, and they were, they wanted to do everything. So I mean, you know, they let them do. If they want to suture something or this, that, the other, and so be it. So they didn't really need somebody who just finished Grady Hospital in internal medicine in the uh, internship. So they really didn't need, need me. Though if I'd been at 1st Med Battalion, which was downtown Da Nang, and if I'd been assigned there, I think more likely I, whatever background I could have used, or at least learned something to help Marines if they came in with various illnesses. Um, so I thought it was a wasted year um, for, for myself professionally. Uh, my wife giving birth while I was not here which happens to obviously a lot of military families, so it was not just peculiar to me, but I thought that was, I'd rather have been here than there, which is probably understandable. Uh, when we landed that first night in the dark and you're driving through, and, and then when I saw the countryside, I mean, i never quite too sure why we were there. I thought it was a waste, um, and I, you know, it, Viet Cong and the NVA ruled the nights. We thought we ruled the days because we might go into a village and do a med cap or do this or do that. But when the sun goes down and you are back on your little hill with the Marines around you guarding you, uh, sun goes down, the countryside was still 
uh, the Viet Cong in, in VA. And, uh, and I'm not too sure the Vietnamese people, you know, I'm, one person shooting at them is just like another person shooting at them. And I don't know if they valued our input there. And, uh, uh, we might, somebody in Washington might have thought we were doing something good, but I, I didn't think we were. And also the NVA, uh, the uh, South Vietnamese soldiers, I was not impressed with, though there are other Vietnamese, um, I mean the Marines and whatever, talk about how great these, these uh, special uh, South Vietnamese forces were. But my exposure was that, that, that most of them were there in Da Nang, and a lot of them came from around uh, uh, Saigon, so we were north, and they were Saigon south, and they were there because they were their dessert. And so the only way, you, you know, you can't, there are not too many roads in South Vietnam. There was, I think it was I-5 or whether it went down the coast, and you can't really walk from Da to Saigon. You can't take a plane if you're a soldier. So I, a lot of them, the question is whether they were had a high desertion rate at that time. And they seemed like they took a lot of pot shots at, at their own people, um, water buffaloes, kids, and I mean, they just, I don't know, I wouldn't have trusted them. Uh, and I'm glad they were not the ones so-called protecting our perimeter at night. But, I, I mean, I thought, uh, the more and more I've read about South Vietnam, and, uh, and you read about what went on in Washington, and. Uh, about the people making the decisions, um, you know, you hate to think, but some of those people who who were draft dodgers might have been more right than we thought they were. So, but um, you know, I think Johnson got himself into a hole, and, and his ego got involved with us keeping in Vietnam and sending more troops and. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I, I know when you hear these people who come out of uh, Hanoi and uh, Hilton, where they were prisoners for five, six years, and it's remarkable what they had to put up with and did to survive. And I know they're in Vietnam, and and I'm sorry what happened to them. But on the other hand, personally, uh, as far as I'm just not too sure what what we thought we were going to accomplish in a country that already had been ruled by the French, then you put the Americans in there and what we, what we thought we were going to do. And now friends of ours who go to Vietnam to visit, and even though we bombed them, killed them, Agent Orange and whatever, uh, they like us better than ever. So, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, maybe we, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. We, we accomplished anything. Is there anything else that you feel like you would like to say? Um, uh, it's a very good question. With nothing, I mean, I, I, I do feel our military and the Marines, and though I might make light of an 18-year-old Marine with an M16. Uh, on the other hand, they're the ones that are protecting us, and I'm, thank God they're on our side. And uh, I was very impressed with all our military, and you just just hate to think what we put some of those people through, thinking we were doing something for Vietnam. And and um, just recently read stories about Way and what we did in the Tet Offensive, and and um, and. Officers there uh, who were telling these people go into the way because there was no real problem there, and then these poor guys, grunts going in there and getting killed without any backup, and the officers sort of sitting there. And it, it used to be called Saigon Majors. They, they sit in Saigon and dictate what goes on in the rest of the country, and <laughs> they didn't know anything going on, but. Uh, but after they, once they finish with their short work day, they can go have a drink. So I, mean, I just, I'm not too sure the military. Uh, I, I was, I've never been, 
I was impressed with the officers I'm involved with. I'm just not too sure the people who are making the strategic plans knew what was really happening. Well, Jim, I, want, I, I on behalf of the Atlanta History Center and, and Sue and, and, and Jim. John. John, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He goes by the name. I do appreciate yeah. what you're done, and and uh, I'm not going to say thank you for your service. I'm going to say welcome home. Well, thank you, thank you. Well, the good news is that I, when I came back, you know, I went right to Orlando Naval Hospital, and that's, at that time that was pre-Disney. So I mean, it was a pretty area, and people liked us, and you know, mm -hmm. and when I got back to Atlanta to do my training. When you told them you were in Vietnam, it's like water off a duck's back. I mean, they, they could have cared less. And I'm not saying I expected them to pat me on the back and give me a free drink, but I mean, uh, but that was, but, but I had something to do. I was a physician doing training involved, but if I was some young guy, just Army or Marine coming back and you know, it seemed like, like I told you, I mean, these poor Marines have put bodies in body bags and whatever. I mean, nobody wants to listen to that kind of stuff, and nobody feels for them because they weren't exposed to that. And so they, I feel sorry for them because they, they didn't have anybody to talk with who understood what they went through. Where myself, I was fortunate. I mean, I was, I was an officer, didn't really get shot at. At least I didn't think anyone shot at me, <laughs> uh, so I felt fairly safe. Can I ask you just a couple questions? Absolutely, just please. Just a do. couple quick questions. What what made you want to become a physician? Was that a long-standing childhood thing, or? Uh, well, the answer is uh, I don't really know, but I'll tell you what I think. Uh, first of all, only child. My father was a really chewing gum company salesperson and we lived part of our life in Chicago. Anyway, so I really was not, there's, medicine was not in our family. But when we lived, my dad was to transfer to Kansas City, Kansas. And while we were there on the street we were there on, uh, there were a lot of um, men, and I, at that time I don't remember any women, who were f physicians in training at the Kansas City Medical Center. And one guy was in, heart surgeon and urologist and up and down our street. And so, I hate to say it, I mean, it's a, I want to be like them. I mean, you know, it's sort of like you see somebody on the white horse traveling and say, gee, I want to be like that guy. And I think, uh, basically, I felt like they were in a profession that I would like to be in. Um, and they would talk to me and I would ask them questions about especially this guy from uh, Dr. Kettle from the Kansas City Medical Center. And, uh, and it felt like that's something I could do and, uh, and enjoy helping people. I never thought about it as money, I mean, probably, uh, but I always thought it was be, these people seem to be very helpful to other people. So it was more being helpful to other people. So. And then one last question about your dad. You were born in 41. Uh -huh. I'm assuming your dad probably got back from the Far East in 45. Yeah, right. Do you recall his homecoming? Anything no, about it? No. Okay. okay. I, I have all my dad's letters he sent to my mom. My mother's letters to my dad, uh, I'm, I'm sure with all the things, Guadalcanal and China, I'm not too sure how much they kept all that stuff, though I have a few of them. Uh, I went through all these letters my dad sent back to my mother, and, and uh, some are pretty good, but one was, I don't know, I just, my mother said that my, my name is growing up was Jimmy, you know, I guess most Jims are Jimmy. And so my mother said that, that, that I'd taken a bath with her, you know, which, you know, and this is, 42 and one bathtub and so and so my father went to says oh don't put my Jimmy in the tub with you you need to take a bath by yourself like you know what's happening 
<laughs> in a bathtub with your mother. I said, well, but I, I still remember. I said, well, what, what, my dad, what was my dad worried about? I don't know. Did he ever talk about his military experience when you were growing up? He did. He, um, um, you know, unfortunately, I didn't really talk to him that much about it, and he really didn't talk much about it. Um, but on uh, Guadalcanal, he was, I think, about the second, uh, you know, there's certain stages of Guadalcanal when people invaded or at least came on the island. And when my dad got there, the Japanese had quote unquote already been defeated, though they didn't know it yet. And my dad said during the rainy season in the cafeteria or the mess hall, you'd be going through the mess line and you see this person who's about four foot ten <laughs> with a U.S. Army uniform loosely on and rain jacket and hat and these were Japanese who had, uh, who had uh, you know gotten these uniforms and and they were starving so they were going they were going through uh, uh, through the uh, mess line so my dad still remembers seeing that and but he also he a lot of good friends there but I mean also in China they were you know this. They did not participate in any uh, battles in China. I think it was Sing Chow, uh, but again, I think this was the quote unquote invasion, waiting for the invasion of Japan. And so, thank God it, it didn't happen because he probably would not have lived. Yeah. John, you got any questions? I just have one question. Uh, from Kansas City, how did you decide to go to Emory? Um, well, well, my father was a, like I said, traveling salesman. So we're like a military brat. We went from town to town to town. So when we went to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and I went to high school with Terry Parker in Jacksonville, Florida. And so while there, when I was finishing my senior year, somebody said, well, hey, what colleges would you think about? And so, you know, I had a wish list of Yale, Princeton, um, and uh, fortunately, I was able to be accepted those places. But having said that, my, my parents couldn't afford them. My mother was a bank teller, and, and, you know. And so, and somebody says, "Well, you should think about Emory." Well, I'd never been to Emory, and I never was in Emory until I walked on campus when I was a freshman. But they gave me a little scholarship, so that was the deciding. Factor. And I'm glad I did and stayed with my wife here, etc. But, uh, I, you know, people, that's a very good question because I knew nothing about Emory except for the, my high school counselor adv advising me uh, that maybe it's a place I should apply to. We found your picture. <laughs> Crew Cut City. <laughs> Well, uh, Jim, I, unless you, I'm good. we're good. I uh, absolutely have no more questions. And again, I say welcome home. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Welcome home. I'm sure I'll think, think of a thousand things, but I can't think of anything now. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs>